All right, good morning. <clears throat> well, let's begin this morning by erasing Bible study. <laughs> All right. Let's begin by uh, opening up to 2 Timothy. I'm going to read 2 Timothy <clears throat> chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, and chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. 2 Timothy 1, 13, 14. Actually, I'll read verse 12 as well. 2 Timothy 1, starting in the middle of verse 12. I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. <clears throat> Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> <clears throat> you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Here we see this repeated theme of entrusting right teaching, good doctrine to those coming after Paul. Paul was entrusted with the gospel by Christ and no doubt grew in his knowledge of it through his interactions with the other apostles. And now Paul has given that same gospel and he's given the same doctrine to Timothy. And now he's telling Timothy, Timothy, at the end of my life, the church is going to continue, though my life will not. And the gospel must continue. And you need to raise up, train up other men to defend and believe and understand and teach the same theology that I've taught you and that was taught to me. In fact, chapter 2, verse 2 is just an interesting study in generations that ought to be raised up within a church. And what you have heard from me, so from Paul to Timothy, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men teach an, a, a third generation, so Paul to Timothy to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also, a fourth generation. In other words, the doctrine, the theology of what I've given you ought to be maintained and taught, ought to be maintained and taught. And one of the ways in which that has developed throughout the course of church history, and we see evidence already within the New Testament um, epistles themselves, is that the early church um, crafted creeds and confessions. Creeds and confessions. Creed from the Latin credo, I believe. Uh, and a creed is a statement of faith that expresses explicitly, outwardly, in the light of what it is you believe about God, about the gospel, about scriptures. Um, they're a necessary part of the Christian life. We've often heard the um, silly and very American phrase, no creed but the Bible. It was championed in the late 1800s, early 1900s. But it's a silly phrase uh, because once you're asked the question, okay, well, Tell me what you believe about the Bible. <laughs> like, what's your interpretation of what the Bible says? And unless you open up in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and do nothing but read straight through all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, whatever answer you give is your creed. Well, I believe the Bible says it's the Word of God. I believe that God says He created all things. I believe that there was a fall. I believe that we deserve judgment. I believe that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I believe that God is 
calling people, those whom he's elected to saving faith in Jesus Christ, that he gathers them within this thing called the church. I believe that Jesus is coming back again one day to judge the living and the dead. Boom. I've just given you a full scope of what I think the Bible teaches in a matter of 30 seconds. That's a, that's a faithful, hopefully faithful creed, and the church has been doing that ever since. And what I want to do this morning is look at one of the most influential creedal confessions in Baptist history, which is the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. So let me pray, and then we'll get into our study. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, that you have entrusted to us the gospel that was taught by our Lord Jesus Christ, given to his apostles. And Lord, may we continue in that apostolic tradition of knowing, believing, defending, and entrusting that same message of truth, not only to a watching, dying world, but to the next generation of those to whom you are calling to yourself, even within this church, I pray now in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to look at the history of the Second London Baptist Confession, and uh, it has a glorious and beautiful history. Just as a way of recap, because we took a little two-week break looking at sanctification, I just want to kind of go over some of the things that we've looked at already. If you remember, the Baptist movement formally emerged out of the matrix of the English and Puritan separatist movement uh, in the 16th and mid-17th centuries. And uh, th th this is really when Baptists, as we understand Baptists, emerged for the first time. A distinction they were different from the Anabaptists on the continent, the Anabaptists of the 1500s and early 1600s. No, no, no. What we know as Baptists uh, were really um, crafted in the soil of Puritan England. The first official Baptist congregation organized in 1609 under the leadership of John Smith, whose leadership was, if you remember, short-lived because after moving the church to the Netherlands, what did he quickly do? He abandoned them for what group and movement? Anybody remember? The Dutch Mennonites. Uh, a group of Mennonites had moved to the Netherlands, and, uh, well, the first Baptist became an Anabaptist. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> the church that he left, uh, who uh, had about 42 members <clears throat> still in it, under the new leadership of Thomas Helwes, was uh, uh, moved back to England. If you remember Thomas Helwes, as they moved back to England, was immediately put into jail. Uh, remember, the Anglican Church is in control then, and any separation from established church, remember church and state, are the same thing at this time. Uh, uh, they threw this Baptist into jail. Just a pop quiz. Why? Why was the government and the church and society at large back then afraid of different denominations what was their rational fear anybody remember yeah yeah it, it was the idea that really what unites society the deepest kind of core of a healthy society is that we're believing the same thing we're following the same god and insofar as you're now allowing different religions, different ideologies, different interpretations to get in the mix, well, society itself, the fabric will, will begin to rip and tear and chaos will ensue. In fact, they had some examples of this with the Anabaptists. Remember, Anabaptists in, on the continent in Germany, Munster, said, hey, we're no longer going to follow the, uh, the, the, the state church. We're going to do our own thing. And, um, and their interpretations were weird. Uh, but one of them was, um, we serve no king but King Jesus. Therefore, you can't inscript us in the army. And we're going to make our own laws. And, um, and we think that the kingdom of heaven is now going to come through us. Oh, by the way, let's, let's start a war. <laughs> uh, and people saw this and were like, that's not good for society. 
So Heloise was thrown into prison. He dies in 1615, but his fledgling Baptist church pressed on with 10 members, and they become known as the General Baptists. Why were they called General? Yeah, uh, General Atonement. Uh, basically, they were Arminian, uh, that God, uh, Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, it was efficient for all people, uh, all people. They were universal uh, uh, atonement guys, uh, Arminian. Their history, however, would have a very sad ending, apart from just a few general Baptist congregations. In the main, all the general Baptist churches would die out in the late 18th century in the wastelands of Unitarianism. Um, uh, in other words, and, 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 and Tom Nettles, writing about them, gives this very sober alarm. He says this, <clears throat> It was precisely at the point in which John Smith and the General Baptists departed from historic Calvinism and Puritan Reformed theology that opened the door to the descending stairway of theological decline. The tendency, says Nettles, of Arminianism to liberalism does not in each instance become incarnate, but the frequency with which we see such decline in Baptist history is enough to serve as a warning. There would be another group of Baptists that emerge in the 1640s if the first were the General Baptists, the second were known as the Particular Baptists. General for a general atonement, particular for a particular atonement, namely that those whom Christ died for uh, he saved, and that Christ died for the elect. The particular Baptists were Calvinistic, and furthermore, they would recover a scriptural view of baptism, not just as an outward sign, but as a testimony to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. What's interesting is that the general Baptists saw baptism as just a sign uh, that could be applied, and so generally they sprinkled. They were okay with sprinkling. The particular Baptists, being Puritans and who loved the regulative principle of worship, somebody give me a quick definition of the regulative principle of worship. Thank you for the hair back there. Uh, uh, what I heard something over here. What was it? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Our understanding of worship is to only do what we see in the Word, not to go outside of it. Uh, and so because they took worship seriously and they understood the word baptizo to mean submerge, they said, ah, who am I to come up with a different way of baptizing than what we see in the New Testament itself? And if it means to submerge, to immerse under the water and bring back up, doesn't that not point to Christ's death and resurrection? And so the particular Baptists said, we will, when we baptize, baptize fully, submerging and then re-emerging. They retained a distinct Reformed theology. They were Puritan in their ethos, regulative in their worship, and... Uh, um, were uh, strong pioneers, as it were, of a Baptist Calvinism. The three major uh, particular Baptists' uh, names that we get at this time, and we, we looked at them briefly a couple weeks ago, was John Spilsbury, William Kiffin, and Hansard Nollies. Tom Nettles, again, writes of these three men, and he says that their legacy, their theological and ecclesiological insight has not been surpassed in the generations that have followed. Not only did these guys argue clearly for a distinctive Baptist view of church membership, but also the ordinances, baptism, and the Lord's Supper uh, need to be applied as Christ has told us. And uh, therefore, and we'll get into this later, therefore, if the new covenant is established in Christ, and Christ died for those whom he was going to save, and those whom he has saved are filled with his spirit, then we can only apply the sacraments of Christ to those whom we see as evidenced 
are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Which, if you're connecting two and two here, that would put them at odds with Congregationalists and Presbyterians who in their covenant theology would say, ah, well, even though our children aren't yet born again and we see no evidence of them being filled with the Holy Spirit, nonetheless, we will baptize them and, uh, depending, give them the Lord's Supper. William Kiffin answered Nollies, John Spilsbury, and the early Reformed Baptists said, whoa, 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 we want to be Reformed all the way. And that means we want to obey Jesus and everything that we see him explicitly say. Their clan, as it were, emerges from the ecclesiological and political unrest of the Puritan Revolution. So thinking here, 1640s to 1660s. And um, it was in the year 1644 that the particular Baptist churches, which were seven congregations in London... Seven meager congregations in the city of London at that time began to exist. And it was in 1644 that these seven particular Baptist churches got together. And if you remember, about three weeks ago, they wanted to come up with a confession of faith. They came up with a brilliant name, and it was the London Baptist Confession of Faith. Very, very imaginative. Anybody remember why they wanted to draw up this confession of faith? Josh? Not just their fellow Baptists, but their fellow Puritan friends. The charge was that, oh, these Baptists are no different than the Anabaptists. And if we let them fester in London, you can expect in London what the Germans are getting in Munster. You can expect in London just some weird views that will decay society and rip us apart at the edges. And they want to say, no, 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 that's not us. In fact, one of the things that was charged against them uh, was the scandalous charge that they practiced sexual immorality when administering baptism. Uh, This was a malicious lie promoted by the Anglican minister Daniel Beatley. Why would he think and say, uh, it's clear that they're practicing uh, sexual immorality uh, when, they, when they practice baptism. At this time, the particular Baptists are the only ones submerging. Just think practically about what, what that entails. He's like, oh, that must mean that they're, they're all taking off their clothes uh, to go to these baptisms. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it was a lie. No, they, they did what we would do. They would put on a cloak and, 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 and nothing inordinate. But he wrote this book called The Dippers Dipped, which uh, went viral, as it were. And, uh, and in it, he encouraged, if you meet a Baptist, the best thing you can do is stone them. Um, uh, we don't want to let sexual immorality run rampant in London. So, as it was, they were being persecuted And because of that, they wanted to come up with this confession of faith that said, whoa, 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 we are not them, and we don't do that. We're actually far closer in our theology to what you see with the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists, and even what the 39 articles of the Anglican Church believed. We're reformed, and we're we're not weird when we do baptism. So, 1644, they published the first London um, Confession of Faith. And, um, and it's very, very useful. It's very, very useful. It was in this period, in the 1640s, remember, the beginning of the Civil War. Charles I is beheaded. Who comes to, to uh, leadership in England? Oliver Cromwell. And Cromwell is uh, sympathetic to a broader understanding of um, tolerance within England. And so he allows Presbyterians and Congregationalists and even some Reformed Baptists to have their churches and to worship publicly. We'll look at him next week, but this is the era in which John Bunyan begins to write and preach and establish his church. 
And, um, and, and the Reformed Baptists during this time grew from just seven little churches in London to 130 throughout England, Wales, and Scotland, and even some going over into the New World. Uh, Cromwell dies. His son comes to power, but his son is not his father, and he literally leads for uh, only half a year uh, before um, uh, Parliament asks James to come and be king. James comes into power, but um, with, I think, a good degree of justified suspicion, uh, they see James as wanting to implement again a kind of Roman, Roman Catholic subversion within the church. Charles II, yeah, yeah, thank you. Charles II comes, uh, and uh, Charles wants to bring in a Roman Catholic subversion uh, of the Anglican church. Out of Charles uh, and his desire to, to leak in kind of more Catholic understandings, Parliament writes to William, uh, who is basically president in Netherlands. And, um, and he's married to Charles's um, daughter, I believe. And uh, niece, thank you. And her dad was, yeah, all right, good. So many English guys to keep in mind. His niece. And they say, if you come over, uh, we won't fight you. Uh, if, if Charles II continues to do this, England's going to fall. And so William and Mary come over and, uh, and uh, basically become uh, king and queen uh, in England. It's during this time uh, uh, that we get uh, an act of toleration. Uh, that is, William says, hey, no more trying to downplay different denominations. No more trying to subdue people who have differences of interpretation uh, in kind of minor things that we would all agree upon as Protestants. Uh, and this act of toleration is enacted in what year? 1689. 1689. Um, and it's out of that time that uh, the Baptists say, okay, now we can kind of come out of hiding. Now let me, let me back up a little bit. Before all that confused history that I gave, when Charles II comes back into power, and he's got his Roman Catholic leanings, he uh, quickly enacts a, a, um, a, an act of uniformity that is not just bad for the Baptists, but it's bad for Presbyterians, it's bad for Congregationalists, it's bad for everybody who is not a kind of high church Anglican sympathetic to Roman Catholic ways. What ends up happening is that uh, Charles II imprisons many Puritans, uh, exiles many uh, uh, Reformed uh, Protestant preachers. This is the time where John Bunyan goes to prison. Uh, this is the time where many start fleeing uh, to the New World uh, in the colonies. And, um, and it's during this time that the Reformed Baptists get together and say, hey, we need, we need to come together and, and kind of have a unified front against this persecution that we're undergoing. Uh, Baptists were probably getting the hardest end of the stick when it came to persecution. Um, if, if congregationalists like John Owen were not allowed to preach uh, in, in certain churches, but were still allowed to run free, uh, Baptists like John Bunyan were thrown in prison. In fact, it was during this time where John Owen was able to go to King Charles II and kind of say, hey, can you let my friend John Baptist out of prison, uh, John, John Bunyan the Baptist out of prison? To which Charles said, eh, I'm not sure yet. Um, but but you, you see the discrepancy there. Um, Presbyterian, sure, you can't preach anymore, but we'll let you go make a living somewhere else. Congregationalists, no, we don't really like you. Baptists, straight to jail or, or, or sent out of England. 
they want a unified front, and they want to say, hey, we're not that different. And so they come together uh, in 1677, and, uh, and they say, we need to update our confession of faith. Now, at this time, there is one confession of faith that is world-renowned uh, from a Reformed Protestant perspective. It was published 1648. It was highly anticipated by the Reformed in Germany, by the Calvinists in Switzerland, by the Dutch Reformed in Holland. Uh, it was, as it were, the kind of jewel of confessions and creeds. Anybody want to take a stab at which, at which one it was? Yeah, the Westminster Confession of Faith. And by this time, uh, the 1660s, the 1670s, Scotland, the nation of Scotland, had made it their, their uh, statewide uh, statement of faith. The Presbyterian churches throughout the world, in England, Scotland, Ireland, and in, in the colonies, had made it their statement of faith. Um, the Dutch were using it uh, as a document to help stem the tide, rising tide of Arminianism in Holland. It basically was an excellent defense of what we believe the, the, the Bible to teach. And so the Reformed Baptists get together and they say, hey, let's update it and use this statement of faith as a kind of base to recalculate a second London Baptist Confession of Faith. Two guys do it. Um, <clears throat> two guys do this. Uh, uh, Collins, William Collins, of the Petty France Church in London, and his assistant pastor, Nehemiah Cox, who together, the way uh, Sam, or, uh, Jim Renahan talks about it, is you can imagine... These two kind of Reformed Baptist statemen uh, in their office, a large table. And what they have on that table is the Westminster Confession of Faith. They've got their Hebrew Old Testament, their Greek New Testament. They've got the first London Baptist Confession of Faith. And then they've got the larger and shorter catechisms. And basically, they're going through it and saying, all right, this is really good. This is really good. Ah, no, the Presbyterians didn't get it right here. Let's reformat this section to make it more in line with what we see in the Bible uh, according to our Reformed Baptist uh, convictions. And out of that process, they come up with a document, the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. They gather um, um, uh, visiting members from all the other Reformed Baptist churches to come and look it over, and they all say, yes, we like this, and they sign it. So again, 1677 is the first time where we see a kind of agreed upon statement of faith. It's not published yet. Remember, this is still 1660s, 1670s. William has not come and given an act of toleration. They're still being persecuted. But they're kind of subtly, through underground channels, getting the word out more and more. We're not what you think we are, we're far more in line with Reformed principles. Um, any questions so far? Any questions thus yet? Well, what are some reasons as to why they wanted to do this? Not only was it to provide a, uh, a, a kind of unified front, a doctrinal unity uh, against the, the, the persecution of the time. Another reason was that within the Reformed Baptist world, especially in southern England, there was the rise of what's known as hyper-Calvinism. Hyper-Calvinism. And the hyper-Calvinists were saying, God elects. And because God elects, we do not have to give the gospel to people. The Lord is going to save those whom he's predestined. All we need to be doing is being faithful in our worship and just make sure that we believe the truth. And this kind of became very popular in the south of England. Well, the Reformed Baptists rightly said, whoa, whoa, whoa. 
That is a perversion of what we see in the Bible. Yes, we all agree God is sovereign. But at no place do we see the Bible downplay the responsibility of mankind to believe the gospel. And at no place do we see uh, the Bible downplay the responsibility of Christians to preach the gospel, to evangelize and press people to say, you must repent and believe. And so if you read through the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, you will see a, a big emphasis on uh, primary and secondary means. You will see a big emphasis on, yes, God is sovereign. Yes, there is predestination. But you cannot allow that doctrine to subvert or downplay our need to evangelize, your need, O oh unbeliever, to repent. And the elders were having breakfast yesterday, reading this, this section in the Second London Baptist Confession. The doctrine of predestination isn't a doctrine used to beat people up with in theological controversy. It's meant to be a comfort to those who have already come to saving faith. If you're using the doctrine of predestination to downplay your witness, you've gotten it wrong. The doctrine is given for those who are already brought in to comfort you and say, hey, don't you know that God saved you even when you couldn't save yourself? So <clears throat> that's another reason why they wanted to update their language. Um, a third reason, you've got the hyper-Calvinists in the South, and in London, we talked about them a little bit, you've got the rise of Quakers. Anybody remember what was weird about Quaker theology, especially their, um, their epistemology? and understand, uh, understanding of, of revelation? That's right, yeah. Your inner intuitions, which they would have called the spirit, they would have called an inner light, it had higher epistemological authority even over the word of God. So the word of God doesn't stand over you and judge you. You, by the power of the Spirit, stand over and judge the Word of God or any given moment in your life. Uh, uh, you can have God speaking to you, as it were, just as He was the apostles and some of the Old Testament uh, uh, prophets. And the Reformed Baptists said, no, 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 that, that's not it at all. Uh, and so the beginning of the Second London Baptist Confession is very clear and adamant. The Word of God is our standard. And it ends, that, that, that section of Scripture, saying we do not receive revelation anymore uh, like the apostles did because we have the full, sufficient Word of God, the Scriptures. The fourth reason why they wanted to uh, update their confession um, <clears throat> was this man by the name of Thomas Collier. And he was an active member in William Kiffin's church. He was an outspoken evangelist preached out in the highways and byways and was a well-known uh, kind of Reformed Baptist within England. Well, uh, in 1674, he publishes a book entitled Body of Divinity, which sends shockwaves throughout the Reformed Baptist world, and the Presbyterians and Congregationalists and even Anglicans are looking in and be like, is this really what you guys believe? And, um, and what he, he taught... Um, was a denial of original sin, a denial of particular atonement, and he maintained that Christ's humanity, not his divinity, but his humanity, was eternal, that he was always human. So just a strange, unorthodox, heterodox set of beliefs. A meeting was arranged between Collier and five other Baptist ministers from London, and uh, they called him to repentance. He refused to renounce his views. And, uh, and therefore, he was um, uh, publicly uh, accused of heresy. <clears throat> and it was out of this that they also said, hey, we really need to reaffirm to the wider watching world where we stand on these issues. It'd be like, oh, I don't know. It'd be like Greenbelt City watching us as a church and two of two of our elders coming out and saying hey you know and we we put it on social media the newspaper gets a hold of it hey we deny original sin uh we 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 have some really weird views 
and the church saying, whoa, 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 that's not what we believe. And the church publishing, this is our statement of faith. Uh, what Stephen Keith wrongly taught <laughs> does not accord uh, with what we believe. Josh. He was a member, uh, but he was um, just well known as a, um, a kind of public apologist and evangelist. Yeah. <clears throat> so those are the reasons if you asked, well, why didn't they just republish the first London Baptist Confession of Faith? Well, why did they update it? All of that kind of bleeds into what they were doing. Um, so we jump back now to the Act of Toleration, May 24th, 1689. William is in charge. More people can broadly worship freely uh, within a Protestant England. Uh, now again, act of toleration, 1689, still can't be outwardly Catholic. Um, you could be Jewish, but in a very limited and controlled way. And, um, um, and you couldn't quite be a Quaker, but, but Congregationalists, Presbyterians, and Baptists by and large could worship now freely. It was two months after this act of toleration that the Baptist uh, sent a letter to all the churches in England and Wales, and, um, uh, and, and they come together, and they make the decision to publish this second London Baptist Confession of Faith for all the world to see. And it's this reason that uh, we today call the second London Baptist Confession the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. The 1689 Confession of Faith <clears throat> unified all the Reformed Baptist churches in England. It was the confession that was taken by Baptists into the colonies of the New World, into America. So um, in uh, uh, 1750. Uh, one, the first Baptist association in America, that is the Philadelphia Association, uh, used the 1689 uh, as their statement of faith. Uh, later, the Charleston Association came into being as the first Baptist association in the southern colonies, and it too explicitly embraced the Second London Confession of Faith. As the Philadelphia Confession and the Charleston Confession uh, uh, um, uh, moved together, uh, we get now in the year 1845, when 293 Baptist delegates were called together in Augusta, Georgia, on May 8th, uh, to form what we now know as the Southern Baptist Convention, and it was documented that each participant who voted for this new organization, this new Southern Baptist Conve uh, Convention, uh, that they would do so as congregations who adopted either the Philadelphia uh, or Charleston Confession, that is, uh, the 1689 Confession of Faith, uh, which, by the way, uh, is just strong evidence that the Southern Baptist Conve Convention has historically been rooted in Reformed uh, Protestant, Reformed Baptist principles. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, uh, when the first seminary of the Southern Baptist Convention, Southern Baptist, uh, uh, or the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, was formed in 1859, its founding uh, uh, principal, uh, 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 Boyce, James Boyce, believed that the most suitable confession for that new school would be the 1689. After consideration, he was a graduate of Princeton University in New Jersey, still a Baptist. He said, I want to make it succinct and, and shorten it so that we still have the heart and substance of the 1689, um, um, but it, it won't take you uh, uh, an hour and a half to read. You could read it in about 10 minutes. And so he and his colleague, Basil Manley Jr., drafted what was known as the Abstract of Principles, uh, which is a, a synopsis of the 1689 Confession, which, by the way, is our statement of faith as Greenbelt Baptist Church. It was also later in 1854 when a young, very young pastor of a brand new fledgling church in London 
that was growing by leaps and bounds because he preached the gospel so well, decided within his first year of pastoral ministry to republish the 1689 Confession of Faith to give out to his church. That young pastor was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon, in wanting to republish the 1689 First Church, said this, I have thought it right to reprint in a cheap form this excellent list of doctrines which were subscribed to by Baptist ministers in 1689. We need a banner because of the truth. It may be that the small volume may aid the cause of the glorious gospel by testifying to its leading doctrines. But it is not issued as an authoritative rule or code of faith whereby you are to be fettered but as an assistance to you in controversy, a confirmation in faith, and the means of edification in righteousness. Here, says Spurgeon, the younger members of our church will have a body of divinity and a small compass, and by means of scriptural proofs will be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in them. This is the confession of faith that this church has historically through the abstract of principles, look to as our binding document. It is the one to which our elders now uh, look to often and help us discern what is the right way to think about something. And it is an excellent doctrine uh, to just have on your bedside. You can get it. It's this big. And just flip to it at night before you go to bed to help you grow in your understanding of doctrine. Any questions or thoughts? Yeah, Doug. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, one of the one of the touchstones to reform theology is that we're always reforming, right, in accordance with the truth of the word of God. And um, and that's just a great example of that principle at work. Like, yeah, you got it wrong because at that time, culturally, um, you know, the whole world thought that slavery was OK. And uh, and so the Southern Baptist Convention at the time defended a state's rights for slavery. And uh, I think rightly later the Southern Baptist Convention got together and said, yep, we were wrong there. And uh, a unified vote by all the delegates said, yep, we were wrong. Boom, look at us. We're changing by God's grace. It's a beautiful testimony to God not giving a people up, but working in them to always reform and grow. Keith? Yeah. That's good. I think it is seeing a resurgence of popularity um, within the Baptist world, but not a surging <laughs> resurgence of popularity. In other words, I mean, just one, we've got to admit that since about 2005, uh, there has been an explosion of interest and commitment to reform Calvinistic doctrine. So that even, I think it was, Time Magazine had a cover uh, around 2007 or so saying, where did all these Calvinists come from? Um, <clears throat> just within American evangelicalism and in England evangelicalism, uh, there's, there's been a, a return 
to the historic understanding of, 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 of Reformed Protestant Calvinism. Whole bunch of reasons as to why that is. Banner of Truth publishing their books. Social media being what social media is. Um, certain preachers like James Boyce, John Piper, R.C. Sproul, John MacArthur. Um, just, just these guys doing that. The bubbles have, have come to the top. Now, you know, who's the most popular pastor in America or in the world right now? It's still Joel Osteen, right? So just to put our Reformed Calvinist resurgence in a broader spectrum, still the world is like, who? Who are you guys? Nonetheless, there is a, a, a rising, and within that has been a, a, a kind of return to, all right, Presbyterians are, are, are going back to their historic principles, and Baptists are going back to their, their historic principles. So within the Southern Baptist Convention, right now there is a kind of historical battle. Who's going to control the history, a kind of revisionist history battle of who were we? Um, if you look at Southern Baptists from about the end of the 1800s up until you know, the 1970s, Southern Baptists in America were generally, uh, well, general, <laughs> a little bit more Arminian, far more practical and pragmatic rather than committed to the regular principle of worship. Um, and, um, and weirdly American in our ecclesiology, one pastor, deacons serving as a board of trustees, and, um, and only recently... Uh, within the Southern Baptist Convention has there been a return to what the SBC used to be, which was decidedly Reformed, decidedly Baptistic in our ecclesiology, Calvinistic in our soteriology. Um, so <clears throat> uh, I think there's a documentary about this, which I've not seen, but Albert Moeller was voted to the presidency of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in the 80s. And... Um, if you know the history of that seminary at the time, it was not just Arminian, though it had become that, but it was going the way of what Tom Nettles warned earlier, becoming very liberal on uh, saying, well, the Word of God isn't really inspired, and, oh, did Jesus really give atonement as a sacrifice? Uh, it was just a liberal theology. Al Mohler is voted by the convention to become the president, and the first thing that he does is that he has all of his teachers and staff sign the abstract of principles, summarize 1689, to say, hey, this was the founding document of our school. It's explicitly Reformed, Calvinistic, and conservative in its theology. And so a lot of the professors at that time, being liberal, couldn't sign it, and so there was a mass exodus saying, oh, we're not going to sign it. Well, he kind of steered the ship back towards Reformed principles. And since that time, more and more Baptists have said, yes, this is a glorious history. This is what we see the Bible teaching. Let's claim it again. So <clears throat> is the SBC there? No. I think right now we're still kind of battling that out, as it were. Um, but it's in the air, and the conversations are being had. Do you want to add anything to that, Keith? We're trying to figure ourselves out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We had no mechanism 
Yep. Yeah, it's a great, that's a great word, and that applies to churches as well. That applies to churches as well. The statement of faith of this church is the abstract of principles. It's not for nothing that at every members meeting, we begin our members meeting by reading and talking about a little bit each line in that, in that confession, which means it's the elders equipping you to hold the elders accountable to it. So, you know, let's just say me hanging out with my Presbyterian friends, they convince me. I, I'm like, you know what? I'm ready to start dipping some babies. Uh, you, well, no, in the Orthodox style, <laughs> sprinkling some babies, yeah. Uh, you would say, well, okay, good for your new conviction, Steve, but that's not the conviction of this church, and that's not the statement of faith that we as a church hold to. Therefore, though we love you as a friend, we're firing you as our pastor, and uh, we'll look for somebody else. Uh, it holds the line. It holds the line. So, um, you know, I'll end here. If you want an excellent book that actually goes through the history, the theology, but the history behind the theology of the 1689, I can't recommend highly enough this book by James Renahan, to the judicious and impartial reader. It's just a good book on this document. Next week, we will turn our eyes and hearts towards John Bunyan. John Bunyan. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time this morning. We pray that you would bless us now and prepare our hearts for worship. Thank you, Lord, for your truth entrusted to us. May it, by the power of your Spirit, never depart. And may you, for generations... Bless this church and walk in the straight line of faithfulness according to your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.